In a land far away, there is a golden river, a place where fish can fly and dance with the light of rainbows. Along this river, there lives a people who survive by her gifts and those of the great green forest. Come with us now to a magical land and learn the secrets of the Golden River. The Amazon remains one of the most beautiful and unspoiled places on Earth. Its dense rainforest covers an incredible one billion acres. To put that in perspective, if the Amazon region was its own nation, it would be the ninth largest country in the world. On this edition of Explore the Wildlife Kingdom, we visit a very special river. It is host to some of the most remarkable and fascinating wildlife on Earth. So join us as we visit the Golden River. The Amazon River Basin, the largest stretch of rainforest found anywhere on Earth. Here, a strange and beautiful river is home to a remarkable array of unusual creatures. Stained like tea from the fallen leaves of the rainforest, these waters are filled with more species of fish than in all of North America. Man has lived here for many years. Today, families still live here and ply these amber waters for their livelihood. Fish of every shape and size swim through this liquid universe. Rare forms of exotic design now familiar in distant aquariums, here find their home and display their beauty. Some can reach enormous proportions. The piranha, the evil villain of second-rate jungle movies, deserves a somewhat different reputation. The Takushi dolphin, whose ancestors once thrived in faraway oceans, has now made a home in this river of gold. Jose Rodriguez and his son Carlos live in the nearby village of Floresta. 
They travel these waterways often in search of the fish and other creatures they collect for sale to traders. Today, they look for the cardinal tetra, found only in this river. Popular for their iridescence and a favorite of the watchful kingfisher. The green kingfisher is one of the better fishing experts of the region. A slight shadow underwater is enough to catch its eye. The country is Brazil. The river, largest tributary in the world, flows into the mighty Amazon. It is named Rio Negro, or Black River, for the color of its dark waters, and is one of the great unspoiled rivers of the world. Palm swamps form vast, secluded breeding grounds for the brilliant blue and yellow macaw, and for their smaller relative, the red-bellied macaw. Humans are rarely seen here. Using a handmade dipping net, Zay draws up some of the 10,000 cardinals he and his son may capture in a single day. Collecting for the aquarium trade has been a way of life for more than 40 years for the people of the Rio Negro. Now fishermen must search in more remote areas to find large numbers of exotic fish. Returning to their village at day's end, Zay and Carlos will transfer their catch to a submerged holding net. Here, with a constant supply of oxygen-rich water and food, the fish can remain many days until they are to be traded. The enclosures make easy pickings for birds like the snowy egret. But of all the life forms to be observed or collected in this primeval paradise, there is one that is most peculiar indeed. The pipa toad hides in leaf litter on the river bottom by day, but at night 
it emerges to inhale its dinner with a vacuum of water current. Two men are out from the village tonight, hunting for pipa toads. Local legend has it that the toads are makers of paddles for canoes. They leave them on the shore for lucky fishermen to find. An aquatic frog, these bizarre creatures are highly prized by collectors in the aquarium trade. They may fetch $5 a piece when sold to traders, a handsome sum for local fishermen like Santos and Anicio. The Rio Negro is a seasonal river, and it is now between the months of October and December that the water is low. Red-headed turtles come to lay their eggs on these exposed white sandy banks. Although the eggs are almost always laid at night, it is the intense heat of the day that will incubate them until they hatch in about 45 days. Barring predators, and early flood, her brood will be born before the waters rise in another season of the Golden River. At dawn, the village of Floresta stirs with life, and the fishermen Santos and Anicio return from their night of collecting. Anicio's son Sandro is fascinated with the catch, as pipa toads are rare, even in this village. The toads provide a moment of fun for Sandro before they are to be put aboard the aquarium boat that stops here every week. The village's catch is loaded for shipment to a port downriver. Fishermen earn the equivalent of about $2 per thousand cardinals, though the going price when resold in the United States will be inflated by a thousand percent. The mortality rate of fish during transport can be high, and antibiotics are added to help prevent further loss. In these poor villages, fishermen are paid by an age-old system of barter. For their labors, they receive hard-to-come-by goods, such as coffee, rice, and sugar, and other precious items brought from faraway towns and traded at such inflated prices that many families here are left forever in debt. A few turtles are still egg-laying on the sandy banks. Golden-backed wakari monkeys are drawn down from their treetop living to investigate the chance of finding fresh turtle eggs. Wakaris normally eat fruit, but relish the opportunity to savor the yolk of eggs. Perhaps Rio Negro's least known monkey, they are among the few primates here that will venture down to the forest floor. Wakaris have adapted to a life along these waterways. 
They have few enemies here, but must be wary of man. Zay and his son Carlos are also out looking for turtle eggs. For the people of the Rio Negro, turtles and their eggs are a seasonal delicacy. The eggs are oil rich and are usually eaten raw, along with a kind of ground meal. Although Brazilian law protects turtles, such laws are not easily enforced in remote areas where people rely on forest and river for sustenance, as they have for generations. The coral snake is one of the world's most poisonous reptiles, but this is no coral snake. A mimic, this false coral, is protected by a resemblance to its deadly relative. Mainly aquatic, it hunts for fish trapped in pools left by the retreating water. It shares these pools with the South American sun bittern, found at the river's edge, and a clever catcher of fish. Both hunters are successful this time. The sun bittern takes no chance at the similarity between the real and the counterfeit and produces a display intended to ward off potential danger. Noted for its stunning plumage, this sunburst of color has given the bird its name. Butterflies congregate on the exposed beaches to take in mineral salts. They dazzle the eye with color and diversity. of the Rio Negro are now at their lowest. At Floresta, the white banks of the main channel are revealed, where months before water flowed beneath the houses. A mirror-like surface of inky black, it was likened by early European explorers to the mythic river Styx. Washed down from the mountains over eons of time, the clear white sands can do little to filter out many plant compounds that stain the water like tea, though it is water that is clean, almost as pure as distilled. Where Sandro walks was recently the floor of the Great River. Now, terns are nesting here and he and his father have wandered too near the angry parents' brood. The birds flock to these newly exposed, broad, sandy beaches to dig simple nests where their eggs will incubate in the warm sun. Sandro luckily discovers a clutch of newly laid turtle eggs. Danger also lies in wait beneath the sand. Accidentally stepped on, the stingray can inflict a terrible wound with a whip of its tail.
But this is a time of plenty for the boat people along the Rio Negro. Food is found in abundance, and the fish have begun to gather in large schools in the shallow water. The Waru cichlid provides its young with their first meal. Mucus is produced on the adult's body, from which the offspring feed. Even other fish dare to steal a quick meal. Schools of many species begin to congregate, including perhaps the most famous, the piranha. Piranha come in many different colors and sizes, most with a set of razor-sharp teeth. And while some prefer fruits and seeds, many favor flesh. Actually, piranhas make for good eating, and that's just what Anisio has set out to catch. Though not quite as vicious as their reputation suggests, they can be dangerous once caught. Many a fisherman has been bitten when carelessly trying to retrieve a lure. Perhaps most fascinating of all the animals that live in this river is the Boto dolphin. Largest of the freshwater dolphins found here, the Boto, or pink dolphin, uses echolocation to make its way through the tea-colored water. It can move its head in any direction, helpful when locating prey. Remarkably vocal, Botos communicate with a series of barks and yaps. Stories are not uncommon of Botos saving the lives of fishermen whose boats had overturned. Zay is not angling for Boto, but like them, is trying to catch one of the river's best tasting fish. A fisherman's dream, this 20-pound tacunare is a fair catch for Zay. In the Rio Negro, tacunare are known to reach 35 pounds. The huge fish is to be prepared for the evening's fish meal. One of Zay's younger sons, Chico, hunts near the house with a miniature bow and arrow. He stalks insects to be used as bait in future fishing expeditions. His reward is a stringer of crickets. Gathered food is preferred here, and although the land is partly cleared, few crops are grown. Like many families along the Rio Negro, Zay's family of 10 children is not unusual. Angela, Chico's sister, is eight years old. Her grandfather roasts farinha on an open oven. The coarse meal is made from the manioc plant, 
ground and roasted to become the staple of their diet. Miguel plays with the pet wakaris, two different types, one from either side of the river. The fish is fresh, the farinha warm and savory. Though there may be difficult times ahead, now is a time of plenty. Two days have passed, and the aquarium boat is well along its journey down the Rio Negro to the town of Barcelos, 150 miles to the southeast. Each week it makes the long trip to meet a ferry that departs there every Sunday. The remote town of Barcelos has a population of about 10,000 people and a bustling waterfront where the Amazonian fishing trade is in full swing. Fish are transferred from the small boat to the larger ferry. A full cargo can be worth millions of dollars in foreign pet stores. The small aquarium boat wastes no time and heads upstream again for another collecting trip. While the ferry, the only link with the outside world, will continue downriver toward the city of Manaus. For the smaller boat, this may be the last trip of the season. The sky is gray with clouds, and the rains are expected soon. At the village of Floresta, the rains have already arrived. As the river rises, it will soon become difficult for the fishermen to locate fish. It will rain almost every day for the next four or five months. Once the rains have begun, it appears that every dead palm tree has a new occupant. Two blue and yellow macaw chicks are dry inside their palm home. Their parents, both male and female tend the young, must climb down the hollow trunk to feed them. Three or four meals of regurgitated fruit pulp are delivered each day. The most spectacular bird along the Rio Negro, macaws will pair for life. An enchanted kingdom of harmony and grace. Life here moves by the seasons, as the macaw has witnessed for years. Triggered by the rains, many trees now begin to fruit. For birds, the pickings can be easy. But the tiny Akuchi must collect what it can. 
fallen seeds on the forest floor. The Akuchi instinctively tries to hide its bounty for a later meal. Forgotten reserves may sprout and grow, making the rodent key in the dispersal of seeds. Though a larger cousin, the Aguti seems to put a damper on that reputation. Seeds are also dispersed by water and attract the giant Morpho butterfly. At this time of year, golden-backed wakaris scour the forest in search of the new fruit of the sorva tree, a favorite among them. The sorva is a tree also favored by man. Its rich latex sac is collected by heavily scoring the bark. The latex is sold commercially, but along the Rio Negro, the sap is used by fishermen to repair cracks in their wooden canoes. The trees will not only survive the assault, but will be tapped again next season. Wakaris are quick to come down from the trees to survey the scene for any fruits that may have been knocked down. As the rains continue, the ground here will soon be under many feet of water. At Floresta, the water has already risen a few feet, just enough to make swimming easier for Sandro. Sandro's parents and his six brothers and sisters will need to adjust to the coming change in seasons. With floodwaters soon to come, the men of the village gather to repair the boats. Sorva is heated into a black tar-like substance and used to waterproof the canoes, the only method of transportation for the next five months. Paddles are carved by the skilled craftsmen of the village. In the river, a bizarre event is beginning to unfold. Like science fiction fantasy, strange beings writhe and kick their way into the world. These are the young peepa toads, emerging from their mother's back. Placed there during laying and fertilization, the eggs become embedded in their mother's flesh. Up to a hundred young are born in this way. They have already passed through the tadpole stage and emerge now as tiny miniatures of their parent. Perhaps the peepa toad proves that fact can indeed be stranger than fiction. Mm. 
At dawn, haunting sounds can be heard coming from the forest. The rarely seen Amazonian umbrella bird, named for the umbrella-like tuft of feathers on its head, broadcasts from the top of the tallest trees. During courtship, males advertise themselves with a deep call, an attempt to win the attention of a female. Umbrella birds were observed by British explorers Alfred Wallace and Henry Bates during their travels here in the mid-1800s. It looked then much as it does today, a vast and exotic landscape that is the Rio Negro. The young macaw chicks are now strong enough to clamor to the top of their treehouse and take a meal from their still attentive parents. Nearby, the fruit of giant Brazil nut trees is beginning to ripen and fall. The size of a coconut, the fruit has a hard outer shell, an effective defense to most predators. But with its chisel-like teeth, the agouti is the only animal that can penetrate the half-inch covering and extract the individual nuts. Like its smaller cousin, it will store a cache of nuts in remote areas. Some of these may later germinate to become majestic trees. Man, too, collects the popular food. And skilled handling of a machete will expose the nuts. Zay and his father discard the outer shells and prepare a basket for the trip to a nearby storage area. The nuts will be stored here until there are enough to trade, and only after Chico has had his fill. Back at the village, Anicio and friends are crushing sugar cane for an afternoon treat. Grown locally, the cane is a favorite among the children. Like the others, Sandro loves the taste. But while some must work to find the last drop of sweetness, others make off with enough for a party all their own. It is now, before the waters flood the banks, that the red-headed turtles hatch. Since they're laying in the dry season, many eggs have been lost to predators. But every year there is still a healthy population of new turtles. Now, too, is the time for other creatures to emerge. This young coral snake is born with highly toxic venom. The timing of their births must be synchronized by nature, for after the floodwaters come, few would survive. It is April and the water begins to rise quickly now. 
spilling over the riverbanks and out into the forest. It transforms the landscape. Large schools of fish begin to move out into this new environment. But some species may not relish the new proximity to old enemies. Hatchet fish display a remarkable trait. When pursued by the relentless Takunare, they become airborne. Floodwaters can rise more than 20 feet, giving Bodo dolphins room to explore their expanded horizons. Bodo's surface and their playful antics seem to come to life in the river. Now their echolocation systems will guide them, not through open oceans, but through the maze that is the flooded forest. A magical zone where river and flora become joined as one. Like some strange dream, pink dolphins flying through the tops of trees. The forest can survive months of inundation and will provide its new guests with the food and shelter that are lacking during low water in the sand alone. Orchids attached to bark near the tops of trees are now at water level, a retreat for spiders and insects escaping the flood. The arowana fish, or water monkey as it is called locally, takes advantage of the situation. Its special eye structure enables it to see both above and below the water at the same time. Once it spots a meal, it can leap out of the water more than three feet to catch it. The rising water has threatened the Brazil nuts at the storage area. And two sisters help their father, Anicio, collect the huge load for transfer to their home. They use a special canoe, as their cargo weighs more than a ton. All transportation is now by boat. The village of Floresta has been completely flooded. 
water has risen to just beneath the floorboards. And yet more storms still rumble beyond the horizon. Anisio can paddle right into his house. For as many as five months, it will be like this. What the people call a time of famine. For fish are hard to come by as they have dispersed into the forest. But some signs of life are still close by. Tukushi dolphins, unlike the boto, are reluctant to enter the flooded forest tangle of branches and vines. Instead, they remain in open waters and, like the people, must wait for the occasional fish. While Inicio waits at the forest's edge, the dolphins stay in the open, and the two seem to frighten prey into each other's grasp. Along the Rio Negro, people rely heavily on nature, just as they did in the last century, and for many centuries before that. Someday, this way of life may change. For today, the miracle that is called Black River is very much alive. The Rio Negro is the second largest river in the world. It is 450 miles long, and part of it is nine miles wide and 300 feet deep. And what about the rainforest that surrounds it? Well, the Amazon contains over 2,500 tree species and 30,000 plant species, an amazing 30% of all the plant species on Earth. Join us again for another edition of Explore the Wildlife Kingdom as we journey into the kingdom of creation a place where nature tells its own story and reveals to us wildlife's incredible design. This has been an Exploration Films presentation.